babe. We'll get this fire going. We'll get it warmed up in here. Hey y'all, Kevin here. Uh, welcome back to my shop. Um, uh, so today I want to start uh, a new uh, series on my channel about uh, Patience the 1916 Indian. Um, and a lot of you know the backstory here. I've run Patience in two and a half uh, motorcycle cannonballs and uh, the last one ended in a crash, uh, did significant damage to the fork and the frame, other things. So today uh, will be uh, video number one in the Saving Patience uh, series on my YouTube channel. So we're out here in the shop. It's cold outside. We got a fire going. Uh, this is uh, this is my little assistant here. She's gonna. She's going to supervise, and uh, we'll start taking patients apart. Uh, so stand by. As you can see, we got it up to a balmy, I'm going to call it 43 degrees. Patience is over here on the rack, um, partially supported by a rain engine hoist, and uh, because she won't stand up on her own at this point. So, um, what's got to happen here is she needs to be stripped to the frame. Frame is bent, and the fork obviously is badly bent. Headlights totaled, various other things. So, um, 
here we go I got to tell you I was uh, I was pretty proud of this headlight I built I'll, I'll show you uh, the guts of it when I get it uh, removed but uh, it's an honest to God DOT headlight uh, that I made which is uh, has been in the past uh, a problem with some of the cannonball bikes um, if you followed the 2021 cannonball at all you probably heard about on the way to wheels through time after my crash there was a tunnel that was poorly lit or wasn't lit at all and there were several crashes in that tunnel because uh, a lot of people didn't have adequate headlights and I think some people were even cited for that um, and uh, I'm not I'm not bashing them by any means you know you do what you can on these old bikes most of them if they had lights at all they'd had either an acetylene light or a dim little incandescent bulb uh, that barely did anything so whatever people had on them was an improvement from original uh, but the irony of that whole situation is I had an adequate headlight, I would have made it through the tunnel if I'd have made it to the tunnel, which I did not. So, nobody's fault but my own. Uh, but uh, that's the way it goes sometimes. Next time I'll do better. Uh, but I put a fair bit of time into this headlight. It was pretty beat up when I got it. Uh, it was one when I bought it. I felt like it was beyond rest restoration, and uh, honestly, I may have been wrong about that because by the time I took it apart and worked on it and pecked at it with a body hammer for a while, and and uh, you know did a little soldering and this and that, um, it was actually looking pretty good. I mean, like how it is today so now I'll take it off I have a potential replacement for it which I'll give the same treatment to um, I will I will treat it to a DOT headlight bucket just like I did this one. And I'll show you how that modification was done here in a second. I get this Loctite nut off of here. You gotta love Loctite. You couldn't run a cannonball without a Loctite, I'll tell you that much. It's a necessity. Ask anybody who's done it. Okay. The nuts are off. Go around the other side and unplug it. And uh, we'll see if it'll lift off of there. It's pretty well tweaked, so I don't, I honestly don't know. Yeah, it seems okay. So that's it. Uh, 
You can see I used these little nylon bushings to keep it from rattling. That's just a standard part for McMaster car. Flanged nylon bushings, top and bottom. And uh, flat washers above and below. But the beauty of this thing was, oh, there went one of my bushings, uh, that the uh, the actual headlight bucket. So that's actually a, as you can see, H4 headlight bucket. I think I covered this in an earlier video, so I won't go into detail, but it takes a, a standard H4 bulb. Uh, which I had an LED bulb in it, which is capable of, I think it's 6 to 18 volt or 6 to 30 volts, something like that. And I had it wired to 18 volt Milwaukee M18 rechargeable batteries. I don't know. I may try and hammer that out, but to be honest with you, I have another one that's in a little bit better shape that I'll probably go with. We'll see. We'll see how that goes. These brackets are reproductions of, of a period headlight brackets that I, I think I bought them on eBay or, or something. Um, and then I plated them, I nickel plated them myself here in the shop with, uh, with one of those Caswell plating kits. So that was a, that was a learning experience. It's, it's not difficult to do, but it involves a little math because you have to calculate the surface area of what you're plating, which in this case isn't too bad, uh, you know, to come up with a decent estimate. Um, however, some things uh, are a little more complicated to calculate the surface area of. Then you have to... Uh, um, you have to calculate how fast the solution is going to give up its nickel and from that you have to figure out when you have to add more chemicals to the solution. So there, it is a little bit, uh, a little bit of math involved with the nickel plating but uh, I managed to figure it out. They have a pretty good, Caswell has a pretty good plating manual that they include with the kit. And it explains everything. And, uh, um, you know, it's, it's kind of fun to do those kind of things yourself and, and uh, have that experience and knowledge. So, uh, if you've ever had things nickel plated or chrome plated or any kind of plated, you know it takes time. These shops. There are less of them than there used to be because it's more regulated than it used to be. The whole industry is, so um, it takes time. You know, you take your stuff to this shop or, you know, some shop, uh, and you wait. And you wait, you know, it's not unusual to wait months. Um, to get your parts back. Uh, and you worry because uh, did they lose my parts? I have had parts lost. I have received someone else's parts. Um, those those kind of things. So anyway, headlights off, um, and uh, we'll start uh, we'll start going after the handlebars and uh, everything mounted to the handlebars now. Uh, these handlebars, um, well, I'll go into that later.
thing I need to do here is I need to re-rig I've got this hanging from the cherry picker so I'm gonna have to put a jack under the frame in order to do that I gotta take this front exhaust pipe off get it out of the way uh, of the jack so then then I can uh, I can support it from other, underneath. I'll re-rig my strap from the handlebars to the to the neck of the frame because I'm going to be removing the handlebars. Uh, so I need to be able to do that. So there we are. That's easy. Now, before I go anywhere with this, I want to show you. Let me just uh, let me just put this loosely on there. You see this, uh, I don't know if you can see that there. I'm going to give you a close-up. Hang on, this is worth it. Okay. So you see right there, there's a smear of black melted plastic on that exhaust pipe. Look here. This is the pair of boots that I was wearing when I crashed. Notice how that's melted right there. <laughs> when I went over the handlebars, my foot obviously was on the footboard right here. And when I went over the handlebars, that boot, I must have clinched pretty hard because that boot slid up that pipe and melted as it went. So, interesting little forensic bit of uh, information there All right, so now I've got room to get this jack under the frame take the weight off of my rigging on the, the handlebars rig it to the frame. So I'm just going to lift this up just just enough that it's supported. All right. And then what we'll do is we'll let off the cherry picker gently. This strap off the handlebars so that I can work on them. I'll lengthen it out. Apologize, I can't show you everything I'm doing. I'm a one man show. I do the I do the work. I do the camera work. I do the uh, editing. I do it all. So you can't 
and holding the camera and doing work while I'm holding the camera, so some things get missed. And I do apologize for that. I wish I, I wish I could do better. Uh, maybe someday Cat will learn how to work the camera. I don't know. Or maybe someone else will volunteer to help me out with that little task. Let's get these wires out of the way. I'm not going to damage any of those. some zip ties down here that I want to get out of the way too. Let's see if I can come up on the cherry picker. enough for now to get the handlebars off <clears throat> I'll have to uh, probably re-rig again at some point but for now for taking the wheel off and the handlebars off and all that uh, this should work for me all right I've got all the wires and uh, so forth disconnected <coughs> excuse me uh, my plan is for now to leave all of that stuff connected to the handlebars and leave the handlebar connected to the post. So uh, I have to disconnect the linkages from the handlebars and, uh, and, and loosen the wedge up and uh, it'll come apart. Um, I'll, and I'll leave my, my two gremlin bells on there. <clears throat> I don't know if when you have two gremlin bells, maybe they cancel each other out or something, but they didn't do me much good, apparently. Uh, so, Anyways, I've got a safety wire back here on this pin that I'll cut. And then I'll, uh, I'll take some little pliers and... that little bugger out of there. There we go. And that way I can take this pin out of the linkage. And that's not good. That pin doesn't want to come out of the linkage. I must have walked out of that. So, plan B, rather than stress that, I'm going to come down here and take this linkage loose down here. Let's see if that'll be an easier way to do it for now. And that Loctite, if that thing doesn't want to come out of there. Um, with that Loctite, if you heat it up to about 300 degrees, it'll let go. It'll be easier to do out on the bench rather than here on the bike. So, uh, all right. <coughs> Take that link loose. There's the washer for that. Should be able to turn this to where it will come out. Or maybe not. Maybe that 
that bad wheels in the way. I might have to unthread it from the from the end. I can't get it all the way up because that fender is in the way because it's bent. turn a little further up that way before it'll reach the notch and come out. So, what we do is we loosen this lock nut and we'll thread that. <coughs> thread that leakage out of there. Set it over here to the side. Turn that to where it comes out and voila, we're free. Okay. Similar thing on the other side. Uh, and the linkages will be loose. And we'll be good to go. This one. Well, we'll see if I can get the pin out of this one. Yeah, so me and Brenda, we were up in... Uh, Washington and Oregon last week um, on vacation. Uh, visiting the kids, Cameron and his girlfriend, Brianna, live on Bashan Island or Bashan Island. Help me out if you know how to pronounce that. I hear people pronounce it both ways. Nobody seems to know. The official pronunciation but anyways that's where they live um, it's a cool place you know it's uh off just off of seattle you have to ride a ferry out to get to it and uh i understand they have a a strong antique motorcycle club i've i've looked at their website and uh, but I don't know anybody. I've never been up. I think they have an annual meet. Uh, but it may have been canceled last year. Like everything else was. Um, but anyway, we went up and visited them. Had a nice time. Uh, Cameron's into antique. Uh, like Honda. Mopeds. And he rides them and hops them up. And. Rides them to work and stuff. He works on the island there for a company called Sawbones. <clears throat> and they make medical, you know, like skeletons and limbs and medical mock-up kind of things for doctors and hospitals and so forth. So that was a nice time. And then we went down to Bend, Oregon area. And we uh, did some stuff down there. Another nice area. Um, the weather was decent for this time of year. Uh, we rode a hot air balloon. And um, went in a cave and went to some went to some breweries and distilleries and ate and drank and went to some antique shops and all that stuff we like to do so it was a good time and we just got back Sunday this is I think this is Wednesday Tuesday or Wednesday uh, and here we are so now these uh, let me make sure you can see I'm pointing here but these um, 1916 Indians uh, Hanna bars are basically like a huffy bicycle you know from the 80s or whatever 70s I don't know maybe they're still that way um, but it just has a wedge down in the post of the of the uh, forks uh, you know that this nut tightens up so this nut tightens the handlebars. This is kind of a stop uh, that 
Um, if anything comes loose, it keeps things from moving, turning. And uh, this nut down here is kind of a lock for the upper cup. It's a loose ball bearing system, uh, cup and cone. So um, theoretically, you just loosen this wedge off and it slides out of the post. Sometimes you have to tap on a little bit, etc. Um, and it'll slide out. Uh, the thing about these is they're kind of wobbly, you know, and uh, uh, with these long handlebars and big wheels, you really notice the wobble. Uh, one guy once told me that it's kind of like riding a piece a piece of wet spaghetti you know they they kind of wobble back and forth now the following year in 1917 hang on i need to get a small hammer So in 1917, they changed the design. Um, they, to a triple clamp type of system. And I'll show you one later. And it was a fairly common thing um, to put that later uh, um, style fork onto a 1916 bike because you know, like I say, these are kind of wobbly, and and uh, you notice it in the corners. So um, I'm thinking that's what I'm going to do. I've, I've gotten my hands on <clears throat> a 1917 fork. Um, it's, uh, it's a little bit bent, but not as bad as this one. Uh, and um, I might use that. And... Uh, you know, to benefit from that more rigid front fork, better steering. Um, now, here's the thing about this fork here. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll try to show you better later, but... So this was a 1917 fork. Now over here, over here we've got an actual 1916 fork, okay? And you see it ends there just like a typical bicycle. <clears throat> and it's got this brace, which was also fairly common on bicycles, larger bicycles, I think. Uh, but uh, still just uh, had the, the wedge post that slid down inside the fork. Okay. Uh, now the 17 fork, might as well show you this one over here going to use on this bike okay so let's get it out of here and we can look at it and I'll set them beside each other later and we can look at the differences probably but all right so you see on this one the three posts go all the way to the top there's a triple clamp right that slides over all three of those and then there's the handlebar clamp. So the handlebar will have uh, two splines instead of one. And it's connected at two points to the fork rather than just the one. Makes it much more rigid, makes it handle better. Like I say, this one's bent a little. You can see right there. I, I, I'm sure I can straighten that. And uh, that's probably the one I'll use. Now, the interesting thing about Patience, when I got her, uh, the fork that was on her is this one, the one I crashed. And you'll see that it doesn't end uh, flush here like, like I said that one over there does, like I showed you. This was actually, it took me a minute to figure this out, but this was actually a 17 fork. 
and someone cut it off and then they took these <coughs> tubes that originally would have gone up to the triple clamp they cut them off and they brazed on this Y casting, which is from a 16. So they essentially took a 17 fork and made it kind of look like a 16 fork. Okay, now it's uh, it's got, you know, I bent it pretty bad. It's got some cracks and some broken braze and I'm not sure if I'll fix that or hang it on the wall as a trophy, we'll see. But anyway, <clears throat> I wanted to just show you that evolution of of the steering uh, the uh, handlebar clamps on these Indians it it's uh, it's interesting because uh, uh, you know they're basically going from big bicycles to motorcycles uh, and this one it was still at the big bicycle stage so all right now we're gonna wrestle this whole handlebar assembly off of here uh, so pay attention because it could get comical. Who knows? I don't know how bad it's wedged in there because of the bend. It may come right out. Uh, if the camera stops and uh, turns on again later, well, that probably means that it gave me a hard time and I didn't want you to see it. But uh, let's see what happens. Here. All right, it's coming up. That's a good sign. show you here what I was talking about this wedge system so it just slides down into the tube of the fork and then this this bolt here draws that wedge up in where these slits are can you see that and that expands into um, the fork tube so you can see how uh, that would be less rigid on something this heavy than a triple clamp arrangement. And uh, I think that's the reason. I've seen several 1916 Indians that had 17 forks on them. I think it was a fairly common thing to do in the day. So we'll call it a period mod, and uh, that's probably the way I'll go. All right, I think I'm going to call that a wrap for episode one. Um, Thanks for watching. Uh, give me some feedback if you got time. Uh, let me know what you like, what you don't like, good, bad, uh, so forth. Um, there's a like button down below if you like the video and this kind of content, let me know. Uh, there's a subscribe button and you can ring the little bell. Uh, appreciate all of that. Okay, have a great day. Thanks for watching.